Steve here again. I want to thank Scott Rank of the History Unplugged podcast, James Early of the Key Battles of American History podcast, and Richard Lim of This American President for all coming together for this great roundup episode on who we would save from history. So unlike last time where we talked about who we would erase or kill from the timeline and how that would change history, we today we looked at who we would like to see live a bit longer. How would history be impacted if a good leader or a person from history was allowed to live longer? Would things be better off, the same, or worse? Listen to find out. Look for more of these episodes from the Parthenon Podcast Network coming up in the near future. To see show notes and learn more about all of these great podcasts, go over to ParthenonPodcast.com. If you have an idea for a Roundup episode, please send me an email or reach out on social media. You can send me an email to my email address, steve at a2zhistorypage.com, or find me on social media platforms at a2z history. Both the Beyond the Big Screen podcast and History of the Papacy podcast are now on Patreon and Subscribestar. So go there if you would like to do a little bit more to support the show. And I will talk to you soon. Hello and welcome to another Parthenon Podcast Network roundtable discussion. This is James Early. I'll be your host today. I am the host of the Key Battles of American History podcast. And with me, I have the other members of the Parthenon Podcast Network, at least as of right now. We have Scott Rank, host of History Unplugged. Scott, say hello, please. Hello. All right. And we also have Steve Guerra, who hosts two podcasts in our network. He hosts History of the Papacy and Beyond the Big Screen. How are you doing, Steve? I'm good. How are you? I am just dandy, just peachy keen, as we say in the South here. And also joining us again is Richard Lim, the host of the This American President podcast. Hello, Richard. Hello. Good to be here. All right. It's good to have everybody together again. Our listeners may have heard our previous effort at doing a roundtable discussion. It was about a month ago or so. We sat down and we discussed the topic of if you could go back in time. And if you could eliminate one person from history, who would you eliminate? Or, we, you know, if you prefer, who would you kill? <laughs> it didn't have to be necessarily a, a grisly murder or anything. But if we could go back and just say, snap our fingers and make one person in history disappear, who would you eliminate and why? And we had a very lively discussion on that. We each picked very different people. And... So tonight we decided we are going to do just the opposite. Each of us has chosen one person from history who died an untimely death. And the question is, if we could go back in history, who would we actually save? Who, if we could save one person's life, someone who died from disease very young or who was killed in a war or who was assassinated or something like that, if we could save them, who would we save and why? So I think you're going to enjoy this discussion. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll go in turn. One of us at a time will present their case and, and who they would save. And then the others will kind of comment on that. And then we'll move on to the next one. And then we'll have some closing remarks. So uh, first up in the leadoff position is Dr. Scott Rank. Scott, if you could save someone from history from an untimely death, who would you save and why? Ah, oh, there's so many people to choose. There's, you know, Chris Farley, there's Notorious B.I.G., Kurt Cobain, all the 27-year-old club people, the Janis Joplin's, Jimi Hendrix. But I'm going to go with a very easy choice, and that is Abraham Lincoln. So why Abraham Lincoln? Well, first of all, I thought of the alternate timeline scenario where he doesn't die. Are you guys ready for this? How this will all play out? Ready. All right. So. In our timeline, of course, John Wilkes Booth's gun, or he shoots Lincoln in Ford's theater. In this timeline, John Wilkes Booth's gun jams up. Then Abraham Lincoln's muscle memory kicks in from his frontier wrestling days. He picks up John Wilkes, Wilkes Booth. He throws him over the balcony and onto the ground at Ford's theater. He looks down at his mangled body, his eyes narrow, and he <laughs> says, Sorry, John, that may have been a little much, but you know what they say. Six sempre tyrannus. So... That is how Abraham Lincoln survives. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. 
All right. Well, that's that seems like a good choice. Why? Why Abe Lincoln? I mean, what what would be different? Tell us what would happen in this alternate timeline. Okay. So why I chose him is because one of the great disasters that came about in American history, I would say, was Reconstruction, the period after the Civil War, with the attempt of rebuilding the South, but also providing legal rights to Black Americans with the intention of giving them full legal equality. It was a complete disaster. What instead happened is there was sort of an iron curtain that fell on the South with the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, Jim Crow laws, miscegenation laws, and sort of a cold war between North and South that wasn't resolved in one sense until the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s. And some would say there's still you know a lot of latent effects. And I mean, you can point to all sorts of reasons why that happened, but I really see part of what what it really damaged America's character, and this was a deep loss. And I think when we look at American history, we see our victories in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and World War II, and think that our national DNA is really forged from victories. But in many ways, I think you could say that this terrible tragedy also forms some of our character. And other nations understand that their losses form their character, like James. I mean, Serbians, it sounds like 1389 still looms large in their memory, if uh, that's correct. <laughs> yep. Yes, absolutely. So what would it look like if Reconstruction had succeeded? If the South were rebuilt, if Black Americans were given full rights, if their partial voting rights were expanded to full rights? What if we had no miscegenation laws, no Jim Crow? I mean, what if the full cultural acceptance of non-white Americans happened as early as, say, in Europe, where Black Americans who went to Europe in World War I were surprised that they were, for the most part, treated equally. What if that happened in America? What if you know the racial issues of America had been moved forward by 50 or 70 or 100 years? So if anyone could have made this work, and historians argue whether or not Reconstruction could have succeeded, I would say if anyone could do it, it'd be Abraham Lincoln. Can't really be worse than Andrew Johnson. And I've talked to a number of presidential biographers of Lincoln, and it sounds like he really does live up to his reputation. He, due to his humility, hired the team of rivals, as Doris Kearns Goodwin says. He was humble enough to support generals and politicians in the Civil War who slighted him, who mocked him, but he realized that they were essential to the cause. So he didn't get hamstrung by his own ego. He had the, yeah, the character to see through perhaps the hardest chapter in America. So I think he could have seen through Reconstruction. So, all right. So just a couple of reasons on what his plan was and why I think he could have done it. We sort of see like a soft launch of Reconstruction that Lincoln did that I think he probably would have done something similar if he had lived. So what he wanted to do instead of coerce the South to provide full legal equality to Black Americans there, he also wanted to use incentives to bring around Southerners to this new order. So his sort of soft launch, his soft rollout, it came when New Orleans and the surrounding parishes fell to the Union in 1862. So Lincoln managed the establishment of a free state government and brought a Southern state back into the Union. Uh, what he had to do, because it was still wartime, was rely on a small group of Union loyalists, loyalists to restore their state. So what he did is set the number low for establishing a free state where 10% of the number of those who had voted in the 1860 presidential election were represented. So there were enough represented to you know, make it recognizable as something legitimate. So what Lincoln did was try to forge a middle ground between the radical Republicans and Southerners. So radical Republicans had aggressive demands for universal suffrage. Lincoln thought this would antagonize native white Louisianans. But he also realized you couldn't let conservative unionists dominate because they'd basically want to preserve slavery in the institutions that existed there. So what he and some of his officials that led this effort, they were Nathaniel Banks, uh, general, and Michael Hahn, who was later governor. What they did was try to adhere to a middle road where there'd be kind of a, a soft rollout of rights for Black Americans in Louisiana. What they were able to convince the delegates to do was that at some future date, uh, qualified black men, they define these as men who by military service, by taxation to support the government, or by intellectual fitness may receive full voting rights. So not ideal, but they thought, let's you know move it as quickly as we possibly can. So Lincoln, one of these blacks enfranchised by the new constitution, 
wanted them fully enfranchised by the new constitution, but he had to accept this delay. And in Lincoln's last public address, which was April 11th, 1865, he argued for Congress to recognize Louisiana, and he laid out some of the elements of Reconstruction. He said, first of all, the state would pass good laws and focus on non-racial issues such as the federal cotton tax, tariffs on important manufactured goods, more economic diversification, things that Southerners were still bothered by when they talked about states' rights. The first thing with states' rights, they mentioned was slavery, but the next were usually tariffs. Focus on internal improvements to the South, economic growth, and not just let the North industrialize and leave the South to its you know, neo-feudal plantation way. So he hoped that once these improvements could take place, then the race issue could be addressed once they'd built up a good reservoir of goodwill. Lincoln said this, The colored man and seeing all united for him is inspired with vigilance and energy and daring to the same end, that is making Louisiana last. So he thought that these enfranchised Black Americans would pitch in and become a part of this new project and with the new rights that they had. They and then white Louisianans seeing that they were actively involved in building up the state would gain allies that way and basically. You know, it's hard to tell if this would have worked or not, but I think to Lincoln's credit, you really see him evolving when it comes to things like the emancipation of all Black Americans. And at first, he didn't even seek it. But then later on, when he saw that it was politically possible, he was able to do something incredibly difficult and make it work. So unfortunately, after he was assassinated, most of his policies failed. The state governments established weren't good. They didn't have popular support. And there was extreme polarization starting in 1867 with the Reconstruction Act. So Republican rule basically collapsed everywhere in the South afterwards. And you see this kind of Cold War between North and South. Andrew Johnson, not a great president. He was stubborn. He was very racist. He alienated radical Republicans and also mainstream Republicans. Definitely wasn't up to the caliber of Lincoln. Lincoln could receive criticism and he could adapt and get along with just about everyone in his party. But Johnson wasn't. So when opposition mounted to him trying to reestablish governments in the South, he had huge opposition. The new governments that were established, Blacks had no voice. And when these governments sought to reduce freed people to basically a situation to slavery through the Black Codes, Johnson really didn't do much to stop that from happening. So radical Republicans introduced the Civil Rights Act of 1866, also the 14th Amendment, where equality is not connected to race at all in the Constitution, the Reconstruction Acts, which established new governments in the South, enabling Black men to vote for the first time. Johnson tried to obstruct all these measures. The House impeaches him. He was nearly removed from office and convicted. I don't think Lincoln would have alienated his fellow Republicans as much. He was willing to work with all factions in his party. So he would have held the center better and it wouldn't have fallen apart. So again, I mean, this was Lincoln's hope that, well, we'll begin by a process of rebuilding the South, and then this will hopefully lead to the enfranchisement of Black Americans. Who knows if it would have worked? I think Lincoln probably would have come up with a different plan based on the realities on the ground, like he did with emancipation and fighting the Civil War. But just everything I know about Lincoln's character and how good of a politician he was, If anyone could have done it, it would have been him. And man, if we hadn't had Reconstruction, just that's just probably one of the blackest time, just the worst time periods in American history because slavery was worse. But I mean, that was institutionally so baked into the colonial life. It would have been very hard to just throw it off immediately with the founding of America. So you can argue how much America is on the hook for that a lot or a little. It's hard to say, but Reconstruction was all our doing. So Avoiding that would have been very nice. So there we are. Lincoln survives in this time, in the alternate timeline. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, pretty persuasive case. Steve, Richard, what, how, how would you react to that? What are your thoughts? Jump in whoever wants to first. Well, I, I'm a huge, I, I'm a huge Andrew Johnson fan. I just thought he is one of, okay, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> yeah, um, right. No. Uh, well, one thing I was going to say, well, you you mentioned the whole thing about that were on the hook. Basically, the disaster of Reconstruction is fully America's fault. I would like to clarify that uh, 
Or I would like to make the point that I, I think that it was the fault of those in the South that wanted to maintain the pre-Civil War society. And yes, at that point, many people didn't have the courage, many presidents, especially after that, didn't have the courage to address the Jim Crow laws and all that kind of stuff. But I, I think that it, it was very difficult practically to address it by then. So I, I, always, I just like to point out that I, I think certain parts of the country are more at fault than others for that. For what happened during Reconstruction. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think when you look at what Grant did, Grant did a lot of things to, I mean, he essentially destroyed the KKK, mm -hmm. at least that first iteration of it, which I think he should get a lot of credit for. But at any rate, yes, it is un unfortunate. And, and I mean, it's really hard to argue. I think it does ultimately come down to, okay, you have Lincoln who had much more noble intentions towards the newly freed African Americans, the four million that were there, and had infinitely better political skills. So it's hard to argue that he would have been anywhere near as bad as Johnson on that issue. <laughs> Steve, you're a huge Lincoln fan. What do you think? <laughs> I think it's a really tough call because you don't know. Was is it possible that Lincoln could have pulled these two different groups together and done enough that it was? a soft landing for the South and made the rights for the uh, newly freed slaves? Or was he so spent after the Civil War that everything still goes badly? And then we have an Abraham Lincoln with a tarnished reputation after his next, when would his next, he would have been out of office by what, 1869, and say he has a disastrous second term with Reconstruction. Then we remember Abraham Lincoln as a terrible president instead of the president who won the war and then he's the national martyr. I think it, it, it could really easily go either way. So you think he went out on top, huh? Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll put in my two cents. I've studied Lincoln a ton. Not, not that I'm an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I mostly agree with Scott. I, I think the thing about it is Lincoln was not a radical. Scott did mention that. Lincoln famously said one time that he didn't want to enforce any radical social change on the South. He thought blacks and whites should just kind of live their way into a good relationship with each other. In other words, just kind of let things happen and gradually blacks and whites will learn to live in harmony. He had no idea that was going to take 100 years or even more in some cases. But having said that, as the war progressed, Lincoln did move in a more radical direction. My personal thought is that things would have been much better for African Americans under a second term of Lincoln than they would have been under Johnson. But in the long run, I don't think things would have turned out all that differently because the thing about it is, is even a master politician like Lincoln was not a magician and he could not wave a magic wand and make the white Southerners, the, the former Confederates, he could not make them have kind hearts towards African Americans. And so I think you would have eventually still had the process that they called redemption or the redeemers would have still taken power of the Southern states and would have still introduced Jim Crow laws and, and all the other horrible discriminatory things that they did. I don't think Lincoln could have stopped that. Lincoln wasn't able to change hearts. That's my thought anyway. Yeah, I, I think we see a little bit of how that all played out during Grant's presidency, because under Grant, you still have this desire for peace and this desire for unity. The KKK rises, Grant squashes it with military action. And then from there, at that point, the South basically was in a pseudo rebellion and maybe not the formal mm -hmm. rebellion previously, but Grant still gets credit for, and he's been getting more credit lately because for a long time, he's just been dismissed as just a, a bad president. Now people are saying, Oh, well, look, he squashed the KKK and, and whatnot. And so I think he gets credit for that. He doesn't get complete blame for everything that happened under reconstruction with the exception of maybe a few times where he could have sent troops at the end of his term to pacify things. So I, I think it's possible that Lincoln does the best he can. And even if the situation deteriorates, historians later on still say, well, given this difficult circumstance, he did do, do the best he can. But his, his reputation would probably be a little bit more controversial than it is just because of whatever he had to navigate afterwards. Yeah, that's a good point. 
Any other thoughts on Lincoln? Uh, what if he had lived? How different things might have been? Anybody else? No one would know. Uh, well, well, John Wilkes Booth. I guess you know maybe he doesn't get killed in a barn, and no one knows the uh, the play American Cousin, our American Cousin. <laughs> yeah, I've I've always thought of uh, John Wilkes Booth as the real life Derek Zoolander. He was ridiculously good looking, <laughs> and due to his celebrity, he was able to get into exclusive clubs. So, and he's he's uh. explicitly mentioned in the movie Zoolander. The sad thing is, I was talking to a guest one time about John Wilkes Booth, and he was saying all these things, and I referenced Zoolander, and the guy had no idea what that movie was. So oh, that was one of the most disappointing <laughs> times in my adult life. <laughs> that is sad. I'm going to throw in one more thing, if y'all don't mind. One other thing to consider is that Lincoln was so universally hated throughout the South. I really believe that had the John Wilkes Booth assassination attempt failed, I think somebody else would have got him. Lincoln was famously cavalier about security. I mean, you, he just, and this was fairly common among all presidents that during this uh, 19th century, they felt like it was undemocratic to have a bunch of bodyguards around them and, and it made them look like a king or, or a dictator or something like that. They wanted to be men of the people. So they wanted to be able to just freely mingle among the people, shake hands, tell jokes, things like that, which after three assassinations, about every 20 years, you're going to have an assassination. The country finally decided, you know, I think we need to protect our presidents. So anyway, that's my thing. I, I think Lincoln would have been assassinated by somebody else if, if Booth but, had... But, but when Scott decided on Lincoln, the, like, the, the, like, it was like an impenetrable aura of protection surrounds Lincoln for the rest <laughs> of his okay. life. Yes. He has a protection spell. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So Nathan yeah, you, Bedford Forrest tries to shoot at him, the bullet comes right back, kills him. Okay, so no second assassinations allowed is what you're saying. No, no. <laughs> Come on, we're playing God here. That's true. Yeah, we're not, we wouldn't be a very good God if you let him get killed a second time. Exactly. And now, a word from our sponsors. All right, so let's move on to our next person. Steve Guerra, you are up. If you could go back in time, who would you say from an untimely death and why? I'm going to go with the General Stilicho. He was a half Goth, half Roman general in the late 4th century, early 5th centuries in Rome. He was born in the 350s, more or less, in modern day Bulgaria. He had a Vandal father and a Roman mother. Now, this was a really, really rough time for the Roman Empire. There's all sorts of external pressures with migrations north of their borders. There's internal struggles. The empire had been split into two by this point. The Theodosius, who had brought the Roman Empire together after several disastrous emperors, then it gets split again between his two sons, Honorius and Arcadius. Now, th there's a, one, a couple of little bits of context and background that might help understand Stilicho a little bit better. There was something called the, there was a bunch of wars called the Gothic Wars, and there was one in the late 300s where the Goths were outside of the Roman border, and they were under pressure for, from some really bad guys further east of them, the Huns. So the uh, Germanic groups are getting pushed against the Roman border. Now, they wanted help from the Romans to let them in so that they weren't going to get attacked from, from behind by the Huns. The Romans let some of the Goths in. They forced some to go into the army, and then they treated other groups just terribly. They put them into slavery. They forced parents to sell their children into slavery for dog meat. And it's from, the, from what I've read, not even high-quality dog meat either. After the Battle of Adrianople in 378, the Goths destroyed the Roman army, and they just had complete free reign in the empire. And Theodosius I, he took charge. He united the Eastern and the Western Empire, beat up on the Goths all over the place. But then Theodosius, he had these two sons, Honorius and Arcadius, who were royal screw-ups. And so they split the empire into the two Stilicho rose up through the ranks and he became a major general under Honorius in the West. The Goths continued their rampaging ways, alternating between the East and the West, and they set up a kingdom more or less in the middle in Illyricum, which is in the modern in the Balkan Peninsula. 
a gothic king named Alaric, he just kept making a major mess of things for both sides. Stilicho used military tactics, strategies, politics, alliances with other barbarians, dirty tricks, and anything else he could do to keep the Western M- Roman Empire going and to tamp down on enemies like Alaric. And he actually beat Alaric several times. He pushed back some other invasions. I mean, it was just like one after another invasion, civil war, uprising. He j- just went and quashed all of them. For a variety of reasons, and uh, really bad reasons, Emperor Honorius had Stilicho assassinated in 408. And so I kind of imagine that when Honorius was going to have uh, Stilicho killed, Stilicho caught word of it, and then he just assassinated Honorius, which there's plenty of precedent for that. And then maybe Stilicho became emperor, maybe he put his kid as a titular empire, emperor and he still ran the show. Now, one thing that would have happened, well, one thing that happened in the actual timeline is that with no Stilicho around, Alaric the Goth sacked Rome in 410. And that was the first sacking of Rome since the Celts had done it hundreds and hundreds of years ago during the early Republic. So really some of the outcomes of Stilicho not being assassinated, I kind of went on a, uh, I went on a spectrum here. I couldn't, I was having a hard time deciding because things would have still probably been pretty bad but I think Alaric would have been soundly defeated in the West and he would have turned his eyes to the weaker East and just completely rampaged over there. There would have been no massacre of the Goths by Honorius. So I think slowly the Gothic and the Roman armies would have melded together and their societies would have started to meld together. Stilicho would have been able to shore up a lot of the defenses and he would have maybe even been able to reestablish Roman military and government control in Britain. So you might not have had any Anglo-Saxon takeover. He probably would have still settled the Vandals in the Alans in Spain. So they would have settled, set up a federated client kingdom there. But so then you don't get any Vandal destruction of Roman Af- North Africa. And I think that this is kind of maybe I go a little too far in my wonders of what Stilicho does, but I think no destruction of the Roman North Africa would have been that Augustine of Hippo would have been like really much more chill after that. And maybe he wouldn't have even wrote some of his heavier books like The City of God, leading to no Protestant Reformation. And then I think just after that, you would have seen a much stronger Western Europe and a much weaker Eastern Europe. But you still maybe would have not seen a, an Islamic conquest of North Africa, no Islamic conquest of Spain. So I think somebody is saving someone like Stilicho could have changed a lot of history. And that's my case for Stilicho. Well, all right. So, uh, Scott, Richard, you want to jump in? What are are your thoughts? What's your reaction? That's fascinating. (laughs) I mean, I I honestly don't know much about that time in history, but I mean, losing the city of God would have been a big blow for for a lot of people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I'm trying to think about this. So I'm not an expert at this time period at all. I was reading up a little bit on him when you mentioned him earlier, Steve. And I mean, it sounds like that barbarians are heavily disenfranchised when the Foderati, am I pronouncing that right? The people in Rome, they're, you know, kind of sort of like clients that anyway, wives and children are slaughtered. A lot of men go fight for Alaric. And it just like the the forces that are ripping apart Western Europe continue to accelerate. For my limited understanding of this period, the Western and Eastern Roman empires, it seemed like the fundamentals of the East were a lot more solid that it's the wealthier provinces are there. They don't have the large borders that they have to defend. Thanks to Theodosius, Constantinople has excellent defenses. And I wonder if the fall of Western Roman Empire was more or less baked in, and it would take something pretty substantial to save it. Although uh, you mentioned like it, I came to mind this awesomely dorky alternate history book called Less Darkness Fall that was written in 1939 about this 20th century professor who gets sent back to the Ravenna, Italy in the 500s. And he basically 
Thomas Edison's a whole bunch of inventions. He creates a printing press. He creates all sorts of weapons. He creates a stock market and all this stuff. He and serfdom introduces a constitution and kind of unites the West into an Italo Gothic kingdom. So maybe it would look like that. I mean, the demographics had changed by the 400s. So if there were better assimilation of different barbarian groups, perhaps the West could have evolved in that way. Um, but from my limited understanding, it just seems like the fundamentals were always, at this point, much weaker in the Western Roman Empire, as we saw a century later when Justinian and Belisarius retake Rome and some other places, but then it falls soon after and a massive plague doesn't help out with anything. So I don't know if it was savable at that point. That's my take on it. Yeah, I tend to agree with Scott. I, I too, am not an expert on this period. I, Steve, you've studied it a lot more than I have. I have studied it some in the past, but it's been a while. But it, to me, it just seems like the forces that were stacked against the Roman Empire, and particularly in the West, were just too great. I don't think one man could have held it together. I think if Stilicho had lived, it might have held out a little bit longer. Things might have been better. But it, it, ultimately, I think the uh, other barbarians would have come in. You know, you had the Franks come in and you had these others. I just think that there was, or somebody else would have stepped in and taken over North Africa, taken over Western Europe. That's my opinion. I could be totally wrong. But anyway. I think that this was a really key, key period, though, in that right about this time, the Huns hadn't come in yet. And they kind of get drawn into the West because the West was so wide open after Stilicho died and Aetius in the next generation, he gets killed, assassinated by an emperor. And that just sucks in all of the all of it goes to the West when you're right that the East was much more wealthy. The the. the Theodosian walls, I don't think were built until a little bit later under Theodosius II, who I think was Arcadius's son, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. Oh, am I Theodosii wrong? <laughs> and so it's not that Constantinople was completely wide open at that point, but it would have, I think the Huns, the Huns had kind of bounced back and forth between East and West and found best, that the West was easier pickings than the East, but if there was any sort of incentive to go east, he probably would have went east just as much. And then you got to remember that Africa, the uh, Egypt, was in more or less revolt against Constantinople. They hated Constantinople for religious and cultural and political reasons. The Middle East wasn't exactly ecstatic about Constantinople. I think there could have been. It, it's possible. It, I mean, it's definite. The deck's probably stacked against my interpretation, but it's it's possible that something could have happened that the West got shored up and was maybe just able to nudge over some of these bad things to the East. Well, all right. So there's the case for Stilicho. Oh, Stilicho, you left us too soon. We never knew you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. So anything else on Stilicho or shall we move on to the next one? Let's do it. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Anyone. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. I didn't have any strong uh, opinions on that. So now we're going to go to Richard. Richard, who is your person you would go back in history and save if you could and why? Make your case. Okay, well, if we can't solve, if we can't save the Roman Empire, then clearly <laughs> we can save the Russian Empire, which was in far better shape uh, no, it, it was actually, it, it was probably a disaster that was going to happen anyways. But the person I would save would be Tsar Alexander II. The, you know, there, there are different reasons I chose him. The biggest reason is that I'm just on a big Russia kick and I just wanted to study him a little bit. But, and with the caveat to say that, yes, it probably would have been very difficult to save uh, the Tsarist empire given the momentum of history there the autocracy that lasted well into the 20th century. However, Alexander II, I chose because he basically was the last czar and one of the very few that was even in um, the mildest sense responsive in any way to anything that was going on to the people. It was under his reign that he basically introduced a pretty impressive record of reform and modernization during his 
reign, basically they began this top-down industrialization project. The number of miles of railroad track under Alexander II went up by 23-fold, which basically means it went up from like almost nothing to something, but it was still something. That led to the development of more modern finance in Russia. It helped boost the economy. It aided the transition away from feudalism. Most famous thing he ever did was abolishing serfdom in 1861, frees 10 million people, gives many of them allotments of land. And then he began reforming the system itself. He introduced judicial reforms. He created local governments uh, that were more responsive to the people that were called Zemstvos. I'm sure I mispronounced that. Zemstvos. And he released a pretty significant number of political prisoners, increased religious tolerance there, which was, is, you know, all of these things that he did were not easy things to do. It probably required an autocrat at the time to do it. Uh, He was assassinated in 1861. He was 62 years old. And literally the day that he was killed, he had approved reforms that would have given commoners even a little bit of a voice in legislative bodies. You have uh, commoners being invited across legislative bodies in Russia, I'm assuming at the local, provincial levels, and they would, actually, they would even just have a presence there. It doesn't mean that they would have had representation, but they were there. Uh, they would be allowed to go there. And right after his assassination, his successor, Alexander III, immediately revoked it, undercut other reforms, including this, the Zemtsvos. And his, he was assassinated in a very brutal way. His death convinced Alexander III, his successor, and his successor, Nicholas II, to basically pursue just a pure stagnated autocracy ending reform. So clearly all of you agree that had, if I had the power to grant Alexander II protect like immunity from assassination, et cetera, disease, by this time, Russia would be completely free, modern, and everything would be perfect there. No, I'm just kidding. Obviously we don't know yeah. if that'll happen, but <laughs> So my view is, and, and now here's the other counter argument to that, is that after an assassination attempt in 1866, he moved away from reforms and he moved basically back to the conservative side and he never really stopped being an autocrat. And again, as I said, most of the changes from him were ver- for basically from the top down. Now, his successor, Alexander III, who brought Russia back into autocracy, well, a non-reformist, anti-reformist autocracy, he lived another 13 years. So I am saying just give Alexander II a little bit more time that, you know, have him outlive his son 13 years, etc. But my argument is that the takeover in 1917 by Lenin was contingent on a lot of different things. It was contingent on uh, Nicholas II being a complete, completely incompetent in how he governed how he governed Russia, going to the front during World War I, World War I being a disaster, et cetera. There's, you throw in Rasputin in there and his influence over the royal family, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, you, you also have to talk about the, the government, the provisional government that took over when the Tsar fell in the start of 1917, but before Lenin took over. So you have all this going on. Now, it is my hope because totalitarianism, communism was such a disaster and a train wreck, and it killed so many millions of people. I think that Alexander II was the last gasp hope that Russia could have moved in even a slightly more liberal direction. And there was precedent, actually, for czars to choose not just their oldest son as their heir, but somebody younger. So I, I hopefully... Maybe he would have had a chance to choose a better successor, you know, instead of Alexander III or Nicholas II. But it's my hope that even having a czar that was even mildly more responsive to the plight of his people could have forestalled even the any bit of the appeal that the Bolsheviks had. And I, you know, just throwing it out there, last gasp hope, somehow if that could have delayed the communist takeover, if it could have moved the country in such a direction that would have made it less appealing, I think keeping him alive another 13 years will have been worth it. So there you go. That's my plan. It would have saved all of Russia. And I'm clearly I'm a genius for choosing him. So 
You, you did absolutely it. are it's a genius. Air, air, airtight argument. Airtight argument. Airtight. Brilliant. Yes. You know, saving yes. Russia is a very noble cause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And yes. Holding off the Russian Revolution and all the terrors that came with that. Yes. Scott, Steve, somebody jump in. You find, do you see any holes in this argument? What, what do you think? And, and my, my argument also is that when, when push came to shove, he was willing to do some pretty radical things, you know, the abolishing serfdom mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Now, you know, he was also willing to say, well, only go so far, you know, but nonetheless, I, I think it, yeah, anyways, yes. All right. Saving Russia. That's an easy one. Yes, absolutely. So I think, I, yeah, it's really hard to see, um, how do we keep the Russian empire alive? And whenever I'm not completely sure on a topic, I always default to the Ottoman empire. And now in this case, I think there are some good comparisons with Russia that Russia and the Ottomans have a toxic codependency where they hate each other. They're frequently at war, but their experience really resembles each other where they have this horrible inferiority complex when it comes to Western Europe. And they're trying throughout the 19th century to reform. And they think, how do you take a emperor, sometimes an absolute monarch, well into the 19th century, you still have slavery and all that, or serfdom, and modernize it. So there are what Richard described here, czars who are attempting to do this. There are numerous sultans, some in the 1850s, 1860s, who are attempting to form parliaments. They're granting uh, new legal rights to religious minorities. European observers are shocked that all this reform is happening. But then those, the uh, parliament gets dissolved in the Ottoman case. Autocratic sultans take over. Sometimes they're replaced in World War I by military triumvirates. And it just seems like the process of going from absolute monarchy or auto autocracy into, let's say, a constitutional monarchy, like you would see in Britain, it seems like it just takes a very long time. Many decades, if not centuries, of a back and forth. Sometimes there are revolutions to create an equilibrium where maybe the monarch still exists, but it's a much weaker system. So I it's I don't I don't know if Russia could have reformed fast enough and absorbed those changes to make it happen. That I'm not too sure on, but I do see a lot of possibility for something different happening in the Russian Revolution. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, Richard, that it was almost a roll of the dice that the Bolsheviks came to power where the Reds and the Whites were fighting each other. There's revolutionary figures who wanted to assassinate Lenin or try to create a democratic Russia in the midst of a revolution. So I think the Russian revolution could have gone any number of directions, but if it would have involved a Russian empire, they would have had to just be awesome at reforming in the 19th century. It could have happened, but you know, it's tricky. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm kind of in this the same camp. I think that by the time it seems to me, I'm no expert really on any of these things. So take what I say with the mountain of salt, but it seems like with um, Stilicho and with Alexander, things had maybe gone just way too far at that point. So you things maybe would have changed if they had lived a little bit longer, but it maybe wouldn't have saved the entire situation and things probably still would have gone negatively a after them, that it maybe it would have put the finger in the dam for a while. But there, it's just the whole situation had gone too far south for them to entirely save if they'd lived a little longer. Yeah, I, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying, Steve and Scott. It's interesting that Alexander, I was just looking up some information about him. He was, let's see, he was born in 1818, and he was assassinated in 1881, hmm, like somebody else we may hear about later. But there's some foreshadowing for you. So good, good foreshadowing. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and they both had beards. They both had beards. They did. And the, Anyway, Alexander was almost 63. If we could have had him live out his life and just die of natural causes, if he could have lived past 1894, which would have been entirely possible, then then Nicholas would have been dead. Like, I mean, not Nicholas, I'm sorry. Alexander III died in 1894. So, mm -hmm. so the throne would have passed to his next son, who is, let's see, Grand Duke Vladimir Alexandrovich of Russia. And I, I know nothing about him. I don't know what kind of leader he would have been, but, but definitely if Alexander had continued on a 
reform policy if he would have continued to have some liberal policies for another 10 years, 15 years. There's no doubt in my mind that there would not have been the massive amount of resentment towards the czar and the government that there were among the peasantry and the lower the lower classes in general. But again, would it have been enough? Was it just not too late already? What, who knows? It's hard to tell. Maybe the revolution would not have happened at all. Maybe you would have had a gradual transition to a parliamentary monarchy like you have in Great Britain. Or maybe there would have been a revolution, but maybe it would have been a less radical situation. Maybe it would have, maybe the first revolution would have brought about some form of democracy. I just, I just don't know. I, I, I kind of think that the same kind of thing would have happened if, if Alexander had not been assassinated, then if Lincoln had not been assassinated. I think things would have been better for a while than they actually turned out to be in the real timeline, but I don't know that things would have been as good as we hope they would have been. Does that make sense? They would have been much, much better. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> okay. I don't know. You're, th those are all excellent arguments. Those are all excellent arguments. Yeah. I so. think I'm content here to be trying to throw a pebble in the the wheel of communism that is is turning and about to take over in 1917, hoping that it'll stop. It, it'll, it'll do something. At least be an annoyance to Lenin. Yeah, <laughs> just to make Lenin mad and irritate him and <laughs> set him back. That, that's a noble cause, definitely. Exactly. Someone should have assassinated Lenin. They tried, Ooh. right? Someone tried. Someone tried. And, you know, and eventually it kind of worked. It was a slow assassination. She shot him in the face, I think, right? Didn't somebody? I mean, I suppose I should say, may maybe more specifically, that, that sounds a little bit ghoulish that, you know, I'm calling for someone's death. Maybe I should rephrase that as, in our discussion of who we would, you know, cleanly eliminate from history with our infinity gauntlet, some one of us should have snapped our fingers for Lenin. Whose influence you would stop. Yes. Yes. We can't do one of these without killing someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're trying to save life, not take it. But here we end. We're just a bunch of bloodthirsty guys, I guess. I don't know. And now, a word from our sponsors. Well, all right. So let's move on now. It's my turn. I tell you what, I had a hard time. I'm sure all of y'all did. We talked about this a little through email and other uh, sources, other means of communication before we sat down to record. but. There's so many good ones you could pick. I, my heart wanted to say John Lennon because, oh man, just think of the music that he might have produced. John Lennon, you know, if you know much about John Lennon's life, he had a very rough upbringing and he, he had a lot of demons he struggled with all throughout the 60s and the 70s. But by the early 80s, he had kind of gotten his act together. He'd gotten his he seemed very happy. He seemed well adjusted. His marriage had been on the rocks, but now it had recovered. And and I think his final album was, in my opinion, his best solo album. If you take out the Yoko Ono stuff, <laughs> no offense to Yoko, but <laughs> sorry, and not on the same level. And and John and Paul had buried the hatchet. And I really think the Beatles would have reunited, maybe not permanently, but I think they would have come together from time to time to make an album and to uh and to maybe do a concert from time to time, but oh, we, we lost so much. I don't think you want to save James Garfield. It sounds like you want to save uh, Mr. John Lennon. Well, I'm trying to cheat by having two, but okay, I, okay. So I, I'll <laughs> I'll give up on Lennon. Sorry, John. But uh, my actual choice is James Abram Garfield, the 20th president of the United States. I'm sure most of our listeners know that Garfield was our second president to be assassinated after Lincoln. He, he was elected in 1880. He took office in Mar on March 4th, 1881, and he was shot on July 2nd, 1881. And then he had a horrible period of about three months where he suffered more. Uh, well, it was, let's see, it was not quite three months. It was almost, it was more than two months though, and suffered from his wounds and his doctor's royally screwed up his treatment and basically introduced a lot of infections into his body and killed him. And he died on September 19th, 1881. So Garfield was only president for, let's see, what, about six months or so. And we will never know for sure, of course, how things would have worked out had he not been assassinated. But I'm going to make an argument that things would have been much better. So in, in order to do that, I think I need to give a little bit of his background and talk about Garfield, the man, and then Garfield, the politician. 
Garfield was born into poverty. He was the last president to be born in a log cabin. And I've heard some sources that say he was the poorest president we ever had, at least in, in his, at the time of his birth. I don't know how you could compete with Lincoln and <laughs> some of the others, but, but he was very poor, but he was very bright and he was given the opportunity to go to college. He went to one college in Ohio and then he went off to Williams College in Massachusetts. He later ended up being a college professor and by the age of 26, I think it was, he became the president of what is now Hiram College in Ohio. It was a Church of Christ school. He also studied law and became an attorney. He was elected as a Republican member of the Ohio State Senate in 1859, serving until 1861. He was one of the most intellectually gifted presidents we've ever had. And again, he doesn't get credit for that today because nobody really knows who he is, or at least not very many people. History nerds like us know at least something about him. But when you think of a super intelligent president, president, you tend to think of Jefferson or maybe John Quincy Adams, maybe a couple others. But he was absolutely brilliant. He could, he'd, he'd learned a lot of languages. He was good in every subject in school. Supposedly, he could write in Greek in one hand and write in Latin in another hand. He was ambidextrous. And this is a fun fact for all you math nerds out there. He designed an original proof for the Pythagorean theorem. How cool is that? <laughs> Smart guy. I learned that. I used to teach high school math. And uh, hmm. they actually had his, his proof in the textbook that I taught. So that was kind of neat. Anyway, when the Civil War broke out, like a lot of young men, he was about 30 at the time. He volunteered for the Army, and he ended up, he started out as a colonel. He raised a regiment all by himself, or mostly by himself, fought in the battles of Middle Creek, Kentucky, Shiloh, Chickamauga, eventually became a brigadier general and then a brevet major general. He was the chief of staff of General William Rosecrans. And then in 1862, he was elected to Congress. And he eventually did go into, he, he resisted, resisted it. He wanted to continue fighting, but eventually in 1864, he went to Congress and there he would serve for eight terms. And while he was in Congress, Garfield was a radical Republican. He was a skilled orator. He was supported the gold standard. He was very strong on African-American rights. He was very into the idea that we should punish the Confederacy and defeat them and and try to radicalize the South, make it more like the North. Anyway, he lobbied for African-American civil rights. And then in 1880, he was really a surprise choice for uh, the Republican nomination. He did not even want to be president. And he went to the convention and he made a speech on behalf of John Sherman, who was a senator, brother of William T. Sherman, who was one of the major candidates. But the people on the convention floor took vote after vote after vote. They couldn't decide who they wanted to be the candidate. And finally, somebody in the audience hollers out, we want Garfield. And a few more votes happened. And eventually, people started voting for Garfield, and he was nominated. He was facing the Democrat, Winfield Scott Hancock, who was also, of course, a Civil War general, much more famous as a general than Garfield was. But Garfield was narrowly elected. And as president, he had several accomplishments despite his very brief term of office. He asserted presidential authority against the custom of senatorial courtesy, which was this idea that the presidents let the senators pick a lot of the office holders that the president was supposed to pick. He purged corruption in the post office. He appointed a Supreme Court justice who ended up being one of the more progressive members. He defied the powerful New York Senator Roscoe Conkling by appointing somebody to the collector of the Port of New York that Conkling didn't want. Conkling ended up resigning from the Senate. He advocated agricultural technology, an educated electorate, and as I said, civil rights for African Americans. He also lobbied for civil service reform. Our listeners probably know that for a long time, at this time, in, in 1880, 1881, there was a long established tradition called the spoils system, whereby if you become president, you fire a lot of the people that are holding current offices, the current office holders, and then you replace them with your cronies. Whether or not they could do the job didn't matter. You know, just somebody who was loyal to you, maybe a family member. But Garfield said, no, no, we need to have people that actually know how to do the jobs. And he wasn't able to 
get a bill for that through Congress. Obviously, he didn't have enough time, but eventually there was a law signed, passed by Congress and signed by his successor, Chester Arthur, and it was called the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act. And that was the first, uh, that was getting the ball rolling toward actually having qualified government officers. But as I said, sadly, on July 2nd, 1881, Charles Guiteau, who was a crazy guy, he, he was just a total nut. And his background is fascinating too, but uh, we won't go into that for the sake of time. But Guiteau thought he should be a minister to France or to Austria or something like that. And he, when he didn't get it, he shot, he tried several times to, to get appointed to an office. And they finally said, no, you're not getting it. Get out of here. And so he shot Garfield at the Baltimore and Potomac radio railroad station in Washington. Garfield's chief physician was incompetent and he was named Dr. Bliss. And I always like to say ignorance may be bliss, but bliss was ignorance in this case. But anyway, they they were trying to find the bullet. Bliss and other doctors kept sticking their unsterilized hands into Garfield's body, and in so doing, they introduced infection. And so Garfield did not die of the bullet wound. He died of the infection. You know, if, if they had had penicillin, if they'd understood how infection is introduced into a body and how germs are spread, he would have easily been saved, you know, if, if we would have had modern medical technology at the time. But we didn't. And so Garfield passed into history. But the reason I think he should have, I would like to save him is because I just think he would have been a great president just based on the little that he'd done previously. He was an extremely bright man, but he wasn't some kind of nerdy geek who couldn't uh, deal with people. He was also a very personable guy. He was a backslapper, handshaker. He gave people hugs. He was very good with people, very compassionate man. He was a devout Christian member of the Church of Christ. In fact, he was an ordained minister. He, for a while, was preaching. He was the only president we've ever had that was an ordained minister. And I I just think his Christian faith and his compassion towards African Americans in the South and in general would have perhaps, perhaps advanced their case. Because we have to remember by this time, the Republican Party, even though they were the party of Lincoln and they had been the party that initially got the ball rolling on uh, better treatment of African Americans back in the 1860s. By this time, the Republican Party, I'm just going to say it out, they'd pretty much washed their hands of African American rights. They they said, we did enough for them. Most Republican leaders said, we gave them the right to vote. We gave them freedom. Now we want to go make money. And the, the Republicans, especially, well, I, I started to say especially in the North, they were only in the North really at this time, there were just a handful of Republicans left in the South by the 1880s. But the Republicans had gone on to focusing on railroads and big business and industrialization and things like that. Almost no Republican presidents said anything in their inaugural address during this time period, let's say the late 1800s. Almost none of them said anything about African-American rights, but Garfield did. And so I think Garfield would have done everything he could. He would have used the power of the presidency to improve things for African Americans. And I think the country would have come out much better as a result. So that is my spiel. All right. Who wants to shoot me down? Somebody jump in and tell me, or or tell me what you think. Maybe you think I'm right. I don't know. What are your thoughts, Scott? But, but could he have saved Russia? That's, could he have saved Russia? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he and Tsar Alexander II could have had some summit meetings and or something. Exactly. Well, there would have been no Church of Christ without the Protestant Reformation, which Stilicho (laughs) would have ended. (laughs) Yeah, good point. Butterfly effect, man. It just, yeah, changes everything. (laughs) Thanks, Steve. You just messed my thing up. (laughs) James, I thought of a terrible uh, pun when you were mentioning Garfield. Um, I know you're quite the connoisseur of them. Would you like to hear it? There is no such thing as a terrible pun. Please, (laughs) let's hear it. Okay. Well, you you have to say it now. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Well, you mentioned that he was ambidextrous, and it's something that I personally have always wanted to be. In fact, I would give my left arm to be ambidextrous. Too soon. Oh. Too soon. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> so <laughs> you can just hear the groans. Um, I, I can actually hear the audience, even though they're listening to this in the future. Their groans are uh, yeah, going across space they and just, time. It's amazing. They just unfollowed. A lot of people just unfollowed. <laughs> That's how bad that was. 
<laughs> no, that was good. That was good. Um, I, I was just going to say that he is a fascinating man. And I think from what I've read about him, because he, he did go to that convention, and I think he was pledged to support somebody or give a speech. Yeah, Sherman, John Sherman. Yeah, on he, Sherman, he was- yeah, as you, as you just said. And so, and I think I remember reading somewhere that, well, okay, so, you know, if you want if he did want to be president, he probably had in mind that, okay, you know, I'll support. The, you know, whoever. And then in the, the next election cycle, because he was in his late 40s, which was relatively young. And so maybe in like four, eight years, you know, he'll continue being a congressman and then he'll go on to run for president. And then boom, he gets the nomination and suddenly he's president and he just kind of gets swept up into he's like, I, you know, relatively young for that time. And then unfortunately, he gets cut down before he even has any chance to do anything. So I, I, yeah, I, I, great choice. It, it is a very cool choice. I think he's another one, kind of like Lincoln, where at that point, the Republicans had been in charge for so long. And like like James had set up in his description that there was a certain amount of corruption that was sneaking in and that they weren't living up to their ideals. And I believe it was Chester Arthur was beaten by Grover Cleveland, who was the first Democrat who was elected in 25 years or something like that. And I wonder if James Garfield could have maybe stopped that or would he he have still just uh, he was at the end of the line for the Republicans and people had really had enough of them and wanted something new. Well, I think, again, if we've got to give Garfield immunity now, he can't he can't be assassinated by anyone. He gets to live out until he's 80 or something like that. But. I think Garfield would have been so good. See, he was respected. I didn't mention this. He was respected in the North and the South. Not that he was just universally idolized and loved in the South. He was kind of kind of an unknown quantity in, to a lot of people. But I think Garfield would have absolutely crushed Grover Cleveland. And who knows, you might not have had Grover Cleveland running. I think Garfield, this is just my opinion. I, I'm kind of a Garfield fanboy, but I think Garfield would have done such a good job that you wouldn't have necessarily had a top tier Democratic candidate. You know, like you had in some, there were some other elections where the Democratic candidate wasn't necessarily an A-lister because they knew they were just going to go up and get beat. Like in the, like, for example, when Grant ran the second time, I mean, you're going to go up against Grant, really? So yeah, I think things would have turned out very differently. I think Garfield would have been elected to a second term. And again, am I saying that he would have righted every wrong in the South would would the civil rights movement have not been necessary because Garfield single-handedly would have given equal rights to African Americans? No, I don't think he would have because the, the people of the South just weren't ready for that yet. But I think he would have done a lot more than Chester Arthur did, or certainly Grover Cleveland did, for the rights of African Americans and others as well, I think. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I I mostly agree, James. So my this is a small disagreement. I suppose. I mean, one thing is that Chester Arthur, he was able to affect a lot of the reforms of the spoil system. And Arthur is a funny guy. He is, it was called his accidency. He was completely a part of the corrupt machine system, but actually ended up not, being not that bad. I, I like to think of him as a good, solid, mediocre president. He's also a cup, one of those guys who falls into office and seems to rise to the occasion, kind of like Harry Truman. But yeah, overall, I mean, from what I can see that Garfield was trying to do, I mean, you mentioned civil rights, and one of the main ways he wanted to do this was by promoting universal education. He thought that Mm -hmm. uh, because of the high illiteracy rates among African Americans, because they didn't have access to an education, he has a statement where he said he's concerned that they become America's permanent peasantry. So this pushing for universal education, which should be funded by the federal government, this is way before it actually happens. I mean, there are states that are working on it. I think Horace Mann is kicking off it in uh, Massachusetts. But in terms of federal compulsory education, where all 50 states are lined up to do it, that happens much later in the game. And that would have had effects, not just for civil rights, but for a lot of people as well who are marginalized from opportunities in America due to illiteracy. So yeah, I think overall he was... It's too bad he was cut down what it, what, when he was. He... From what I know, he could have done a lot of good. Yeah, I mean, Lincoln at least got a full term and and a little bit of a second one. But poor old Garfield, other than William Henry Harrison, he has the shortest term of any president. Oh, and to your point about Arthur. Yeah, Arthur, 
is a fascinating guy. Arthur did his best to carry out some of Garfield's ideas, but he just didn't have the the force of personality that Garfield had. He was kind of a weak man, but yeah, he's definitely a middle of the road or Arthur was better than he gets credit for. He certainly doesn't deserve to be on Mount Rushmore by any stretch of imagination, but he <laughs> he's not one of the worst either. All the stone to make those mutton chops would have taken a lot. Oh, no kidding. That's true. Well, I, I was going to say that Garfield, I mean, whether or not he could have stemmed the tide of of uh, Jim Crow and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it would have been very difficult to do, but I think that he would have remained a moral spokes, a sp- spokesperson on the issue of African-American rights from the moral perspective. That, And I think that would have counted for something because once you go from Hayes on, the issue was basically, okay, as, you, as uh, I think Scott or I, it might have been, I, don't, I forgot who said, but basically it was the idea that okay, the Republican Party is going to wash their hands of this. And pretty much from Hayes on, that's what happened. But Garfield could have been the one president that could have kept saying that, no, this is a moral issue that we do have to deal with. Yeah, I think he would have said, you know, we, we need to, and he wanted, he wanted to pick up the, the mantle of Lincoln again, you know, and not just be the, the, the party for people that want to make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I think things like that do matter historically. Um, you know, does that mean he could have solved the issue? Well, might have been beyond his capability or anyone's capability to do. But it, historically, things like that do matter in someone's legacy. I think both. Um, I mean, it depends, too, with Arthur. He didn't have great relations with the Native Americans, and that's where they opened up um, reservations in the mm-hmm. West for white settlers to go into Native American lands. And then there was the I think, was it during Arthur? It was kind of a controversy that uh, with Arthur that led into Cleveland's presidency about annexing Hawaii. And then the U.S. helped overthrow the Hawaiian government, the queen there. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that that would have been interesting to see how somebody who maybe would have played that out differently. Yeah, definitely. Well, all right. So there are our candidates, listeners. Fellas, do you have any final thoughts before we sign off? I think we're grappling with the, I think, the idea of human agency and how much human agency determines these currents of history, these very long, the inertia that history has. And I I think we've kind of come to the conclusion that uh, currents may be hard to change, but there's still certain things that an individual can do that Mm -hmm. that still matters to history. That's kind of what I got out of it. Mm hmm. Scott, Steve, any thoughts? I think it's it's kind of hard to say, too. I think just listening to all of these, it's it's much more difficult to say what would happen good as opposed to killing someone and stopping bad. Right. It seems that because you just don't know, could have things have gone really in an opposite direction against this person who had done a lot of good prior to their early death? Could have things just like the Richard saying, could the currents of history have really swung against these people and things would they we would be remembering them in a lot different light if they did live longer than they actually did? That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, I th- th- I would follow that up too. That it's easy to look at a mass murderer and say that person was a bad person. They Mao or Stalin should not be in our timeline. But for we're choosing people not so much for how good they are, but the good they could have done. And you can definitely plan like that. You can try to cause it through your skill, through your leadership, through your moral character. But then there's a lot that's just pure happenstance. Things just sort of happen and you might have a stroke of good Mm -hmm. luck. And James and I discuss that ad nauseum where George Washington was basically saved the life of an old gypsy woman and received a blessing of good luck because he just fell into it over and over and over in his life. Um, I mean, (laughs) you see that with presidential campaigns, just like, you know, Richard, where in the nomination period where different people are, are discussing throwing their hat into the ring, someone might be deemed a very strong contender because they are a four-star general or they have this or that background and they were a highly successful governor. But then when they actually begin campaigning, they're terrible. They make gaffe after gaffe after gaffe. And all of the conventional wisdom and idea 
ideas and things like that that build up why this person is good crumbles instantly when they have to face reality. So if I could, you know, have an alternate timeline generator and see what would happen. Yeah, I mean, I like to think Lincoln would have done a lot of good, but who knows? I mean, maybe it could have been a case of you either die a hero or live long enough to become a villain. The Christopher Nolan Dark Knight logic Mm -hmm. at work there very well could be the case. (laughs) Well, all right. That is our roundtable discussion. Listeners, what do you think? Who do you think won this debate, if you want to call it that? Which which one of us presented the strongest case? Or is there somebody else that you think history would have been better served than any of the four we mentioned if they'd had their life saved, if their untimely death had been prevented? Let's discuss this on Facebook. So we'll We'll put a link to the episode in History Unplugged and in American History Fanatics and perhaps some other groups. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and, and let's, let's get a good discussion going. That's, the, that's really the whole point of all this exercise is so we can talk over things and get good ideas and, and we can all learn from each other. Well, all right. That is our discussion again. We're going to wrap it up. We're going to say goodbye to you and hopefully we'll get together and do another roundtable discussion sometime in the near future. Take care, everyone. 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 Take care, everyone.